Hello and welcome to Time to Talk with Howard Kirby. I've just had a really enjoyable 45 minutes chatting to Howard, who I've known for a long time, reminiscing and talking about all things from Cooney Cooney Pigs through to World Champions and deer stalking and grouse shooting. So I hope you enjoy it. it. We rambled a bit, but it was really lovely. So get yourself a cuppa, settle down and enjoy Time to Talk with Howard Kirby. Take care, stay safe. Bye-bye. Okay. Okay. Hi folks, I'm here with Howard Kirby from Mullins Court Gun Dogs and Lane Shooting School. And I've got to say, I'm so looking forward to talking to Howard. He always just makes me laugh. So, no pressure, Howard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, especially if I'm going to make you laugh. <laughs> yeah, I'll probably be falling all over myself tonight. I'll be giggling and not be able to get the words out. And, <laughs> yeah. So, how are you doing? Are you enjoying the sun? Yes, thank you, Les. Yeah, this the sunshine and the COVID um, kind of layoff has all come at the right time for us, really. So uh, it's given us lots of opportunity to get outside and um, do lots of dog training. But more importantly, at this stage of the game, uh, lots of maintenance that we would have been doing otherwise, but without the pressure of ongoing lessons and the shooting school being open. Mm. No, that's great. And... Um... So has it affected you much, being in lockdown or not, only from a positive um, it's, quite, it's quite funny, isn't it? I saw a post on Facebook the other day saying, you, you know you're antisocial when your lifestyle doesn't change. And, um, no. you know, I still, I haven't been off this property since I came back from North, Northumberland about five weeks ago. Uh-huh. But that's not unusual, unless there's somewhere for me to go with the dog or the gun. Um, so... Um, uh, clearly the shooting school uh, is closed and we're not doing lessons. So we're not having customers coming up, but um, you know, it's um, at the moment financially we're okay. And uh, as I said earlier, it's, it gives us an opportunity to get on and get some jobs done that otherwise that, you know, the, the customers would have been in the way. Dare mm-hmm. I say that? Yeah. Craig. So um, I've known you for quite a while now. And so yeah. I'm going to go digging into your past because a lot of people, <laughs> probably know you from Mullins Court TV, which is a big, a big group that you've got on Facebook, a big training group. And, um, and from Sport and Shooter, you know, the, the gun dog man from Sport and Shooter. But I yeah. know you from years ago when you were still very much a lab man. Correct. Yeah. And yeah. A long time ago. You know, trialing. I'm not going to go trialing. I'm a lab <laughs> man. I, I go shooting. I'm a shooting man. And yeah. So, and that, can you remember you had the pig? Was it a Cooney Cooney pig? Yeah, correct. Yeah, we had Lottie. Lottie. Yeah, yeah, she terrorised the shooting school for quite some time. Uh-huh. So you're one of the only people that I know who's actually tra- trained a Cooney Cooney pig. Cause it, did you click a train her? Or, yeah. Well, tell, me was, about, was, tell me about your pig to start off with. Well, we had her as a pet. Pig. Yeah, we had her as a pet as a bit of fun. And um, she, she was a real character. I like pigs. Pigs are, aren't they? And, and to be fair, we, we kind of over socialized her really and she was a naughty pig and um i was kind of interested in clicker at that time i was exploring the use of clickers in dog training so it seemed a good opportunity to try and um, have a bit of fun with lottie and clicker train her so we tried to sit and to beg and to stuff like that but uh, um she didn't have the social airs and graces of a dog she <laughs> would um the last straw was uh, three days in a row she would wait till the shooting school clubhouse door was open and she did a ram raid. She basically barged past customers as they opened the door, ran into the clubhouse, grabbed a bag of Mars bars. And this was the funny <laughs> bit. She knew we would chase her and try and get them off her. And she just ran and plowed into um, uh, a big um, bush of brambles, uh-huh. got herself in the middle and within seconds consumed the five Mars bars and all the paper and everything with it. So subsequently, she became, to be fair, she became too much of a handful for us here at the shooting school with public here. So she moved down to the New Forest and um, was let out on, under commoners' rights onto the New Forest. But again, because she was over-socialised, um, she became troublesome in the New Forest because, of course, if she <laughs> spotted somebody with a picnic, there's a lot of funny stories came out that there's a lot of charging in and just rampage through their picnic so she was a bit of a nuisance they had to take her off the forest in the end because she became too naughty so she was good fun good fun 
that's so funny. But why a pig? Because you, you, you've got a background, haven't you, with pigs? Yeah, so I, I kind of cut my teeth farming pigs. Uh, I learned uh, uh, my agricultural trade, my livestock trade in pigs. I had an outdoor pig herd of my own come the end. And um, so I've always had an interest in, in livestock and animals and pigs particularly. They're fascinating creatures. They are, I mean, I, I used to... I mean, they were huge. They're just huge. One of my friends used to keep her horses and I was doing an allotment and there was pigs. And like that, they'd come running through the stables and you just had to get out of the way. You'd jump up on the walls. Yeah. And just these huge pigs. And some of them had massive tusks as well. Yeah. And that, yeah, well, that's the advantage of these Cooney Coonies. Obviously, they're a little bit smaller. I mean, she was meant to be a, a micro pig, like so many micro pigs that get sold to unsuspecting public and she grew to be pretty she grew to be pretty big but she wasn't the size of a full-blown commercial sow which are as you say they're just huge aren't they that's just a, and we we raised a couple of piglets um when i was 17 i worked in a hunt yard and yeah. we raised a couple of piglets and it was heartbreaking sending them off to slaughter and even yeah. now i mean i've not long started eating vegan they took me it's then you just like come 40 back years, you know 30 <laughs> years i started eating, eating pigs again um mm -hmm. and it's only it's only bacon because it doesn't look like a pig it doesn't look like the little piglets that's right yeah it's, it's hard when you when you read the animals yourself yeah mm. so mm -hmm. then you got into dogs was it dogs then or was it was it uh, dogs were dogs were, were were there whilst i was farming Mm -hmm. uh for shooting yeah yes yeah. so i had um, my first labrador in 87 i think first labrador of my own in a grown-up kind of way uh -huh. and um and so um that was the first dog i kind of trained as a shooting dog from in 1987 her name was margo and she was a black labrador yeah. uh -huh. and so why did you move across the spaniels oh uh, gosh um why did I move across to Spaniels? I you know, nuts it, you definitely a yeah, lot man when I, I met think you. I think I've always I've always enjoyed the drive in a dog, you know, a dog with real drive and, and it was clear to me that Spaniels obviously this is controversial, I'll upset all the Labrador people now. <laughs> I still train and keep own Labradors, by the way, just in case I'm gonna get yeah, no, no hissing, no hissing. No, <laughs> no, no booing or hissing. But um uh, I I just enjoyed that drive, that that really hard hunting drive uh, that the Spaniels brought to the party and, and that's kind of stuck with me as now, you know, I've got an interest now in, in all of the hunting dogs being that I now compete with hunt point retrievers and setters and pointers as well. Just that drive, I think, that, 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 that drew me in and still holds me in, in there with them now. Mm. And so do you still work with Spaniels? Do you still have them? Absolutely, yeah. Um, in fact, Excuse me. Um, uh, in fact, um, uh, I have just acquired three more Spaniels with a view to um, uh, competing with them this year. So I've bought a 40-month-old, a 60-month-old and a two-year-old in, in the hope that I can get at least two of them ready for the competition season this year. And then we've bought a young cocker that won't be ready f till uh, 2021 season. So back into Spaniels in a big way. I mean, it's always been my my end game has always been to f to uh, get a business running enough to allow me time just to compete whenever I wanted to. So now I can compete the pointers and setters through the spring and summer and then field trial um, and compete with the Spaniels and the hunt point retrievers through the winter as well as all the shooting and fun that goes on. So we're getting closer to that, closer to having the time to be able to do that. That's awesome. So... Um... Right, I'm going to rewind slightly. So I've seen you bringing on a very young, she was quite a nervous wee spaniel on the mum's yeah, court TV. Really. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, are, are, you, are you bringing her on for, uh, so do you still do your demos? Do you still do all of your display work? No, this is now? interesting. This is the first year we've chosen not to do demos. We're going to have at least a two-year break uh -huh. um, to see whether I can cope with I say, cope. I don't think I'll go back to doing demos other than um, we've been asked to do the game fair for the last two years and probably this year coming. So we'll probably do two or three of the bigger shows a year. But being on the road uh, here, uh, there's so much going on at Mullins Cope and, and the shooting school now. I really need to be here. And if I'm honest, you know, uh, 
people tease me and kind of call this Fort Kirby here, but I love it here. This is my playground, you know, I, the, wow. the people I love being with, my family all are here. Most of them are here and work and help out here um, as a business. And um, most of my mates through, through um, dogs and shooting come here. So it, it's, it's, I've no great desire to be away from home, if I'm on it, honest, Les. Um, so um, it kind of suits me not to go on the road and do the shows. They're really hard work, you know. Yeah. It kind of sounds great fun, and it is. When we were young and enthusiastic, you know, we were doing about 25 weekends a year, mm. which was huge. We were away more, almost, well, 52 weeks in the year. We were away almost as much as we were here. Um, and it was good fun, but it's hard work. It requires a lot of commitment. It requires a big team of dogs and the vehicles to transport us around the, the, the country in relative comfort. So we've arrived at a point where we made a conscious decision last year to tell all the shows that we won't be coming out for this year. So first year off. Wow, I mean, great for you, but really sad for everybody because um, I've seen you and you've just been a few times and there's no, for me, there's nobody better. You're such a showman and you just hold <laughs> the crowd and you draw everybody in, you get everybody, you know, cheering and you'll work a dog and then take the mickey out of somebody in the audience and <laughs> it's just a joy. So people who haven't Thank seen... You. Well, it's a wonder if I'm not a thick ear from taking the mickey out of people in the audience. Well, yes. <laughs> it's probably my, well, I'm just going to quit now, but while, I, while, I'm, while I'm ahead, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, or oh, the people, you know, it'll be a real uh, miss at the game phase because it was always such good fun seeing you. But, I mean, amazing that you're doing so. Why why did you transition from Spaniels to HBOs? Because I've, I've got a Spaniel now. I had a Spaniel for five years, which is kind of, I don't know how I ended up with a Spaniel. <laughs> But, you know, in one of my instructors runs Visualize and she keeps saying, oh, you would really sit at HPL, get HPL. And uh, and I think for me, if I was going to get HPL, it would be Spinoni, which I know isn't uh, the, the punchiest breed of all, but I just love them. So why, why, you know, if you like this real punchy hunting driver of the Spaniel, why did you transition across to... Well... Um, I, I was fortunate enough, it literally was, it was uh, like um, with the pointers and setters as well. I was invited to go out on a day where some friends of mine who own and hunt and trial, um, very successful people actually, uh, German longhead pointers, hunt point retrievers. And um, I went and had two days with them up in uh, Suffolk on sugar beet. And uh, the way the dogs work, the sugar beet, the way the dogs produce birds, just was fascinating it was inspiring and so much so that um my pal rob gould who i was staying with and, and it was his dogs we were shooting over uh, i came home with one of his old field trial champions literally that's typical of me you know like going at the deep end so i was just just inspired by them absolutely inspired and i just thought i've got to have one of these and he said well take her home so i had his dog for the rest of the shooting season and she went back and um and uh yeah absolutely hooked les just uh, you know the the ability of the hunt point retriever to point i think it's i think it's the pointing element that that um i even we, we know this from doing shows people who were, aren't really that enthusiastic about dogs when they see a dog on point it's it's a dog at the top of its game it's it's absolutely in the moment in terms of its hunting uh, drive and um to see that massive control just makes people you know, uh, it's an overused phrase, but the kind of the heads and the back of your neck moment that it's, it's one of those. And so that's what I love about the pointing breeds and, and also the pointers and setters. Um, so that's how we got in. And um, I've not looked back, really. We've just, you know, just gone hook, line and sinker into them now. Mm. Yeah, because I mean, for me, I just love that. Um, is it, oh, Craig, is it Refu Vigilers? He puts a lot of videos up and watching his dogs work as a team and you see them in in the go on point like the first dog will go on point and i i don't i'm not a hpl person so i don't know all of the proper terminology so please correct me if i get it wrong but yeah you see the first dog the lead dog go on point and then very slowly the dogs behind them almost form like an arrowhead formation when they're working yeah. in the pack and then the next one will come forward and then the stalk and i just think it's so um primal you know you can almost yes. imagine like uh, of, all the, of all the hunting we do with dogs it's the one that seems most 
like pack hunting, as you say, you know, where you're hunting them in, in braces or more, the dogs will, the word you were looking for is back. The, the okay. second dog will come in and back. And, and I keep deferring my hunt point retrieve clients to a piece in David Attenborough's film, usually uh, on the trailer to some of his films. And you see the wild hunting dogs. Yeah. And they, there's, a, there's a clip of film that they use that is just... I keep watching and watching and watching it. There's about a pack of about eight or nine hunting dogs all lined up, all on point. And you kind of know, and I know this is very primeval, that, but any prey on the end of that pack is in a lot of trouble. You know, they're very, very successful hunters. And, and the hunt point retrievers is a slightly diluted version of that, but it's as close as you can get to seeing a dog really hunting naturally, really, really hunting naturally. You know, with the Spaniels, we... That, uh, don't don't misunderstand me. I, I, I love spaniels. It's what I like doing. But it's it's a bit more human. We the uh, the humans influence it a bit more. But with the hunt point retrieve, we're, we're kind of relying on the dag. A lot of the dog's natural instincts there. Yeah. So <clears throat> when um when the when the hunt is a pack, would would you say it was a pack, or would you hunt them? You know, would you hunt them? Uh, you know, we'd hunt them as a brace. You'd be a brace. Yeah. So when we compete the hunt point retrievers, we only run them as singles. But um, there is no reason why you couldn't, on a shoot-over day, a shooting day, hunt two, three, four dogs. As long as they're well-scored and they know each other, then they will work as a pack. They will, they will back each other. So the first dog that finds game holds point, and then the other dogs should come in behind and shouldn't steal his or her point. They should come in up behind and back in, you know, not, not, not take over the point and spoil the moment. So the so the, the back dog, the second dog, yeah. um, they take they take over. They they would then stalk forward, and they would become like yeah. the dog. Or no, I mean in, in its pure form, what should happen is that so you will have in a pack pack situation in a wild pack, you'll have a a dog that's more dominant than the other, and yeah. they might well take over the lead. Yeah. But in competition, where we're being marked. So in the pointers and setters, we, we hunt them in braces. Right. So there's two dogs in, in the trial at the same time hunting. And so uh, when the first dog finds a, a bird and comes on point, the second dog should come in and back. And when that second dog backs, it shouldn't put pressure on the lead dog. Um, okay. It shouldn't force the dog and it definitely shouldn't uh, claim the point itself. It shouldn't overtake and, and, and get in front. So it must stay behind at all times. So, physically so, and, and mentally so in a mm. pack situation so because i'm i'm looking I'm, my behavior head is going tick 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 mm. um you know i've done quite a bit of work with wolves as well and so the whole thing is uh so the the lead dog would be um for want of a better word the alpha i'm probably gonna get hissed at and then the second dog would be the beta dog which always sits in behind unless it the yeah in, in theory do you know what Les, it, 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 it's a good question in a wild situation i don't know because of course the lead dog initially will always be the dog that finds birds or finds the prey so you know if you've got four or five dogs hunting a bigger a savannah or something then whichever dog finds will be the dog that indicates and so once the dogs know about pointing, any, any other pointer or setter in the field, as soon as this dog locates prey the and rest, on yeah. point, then the second, the second, the third and fourth dog will react. They'll go, oh, look, Fido's found one. So they'll come in and join in with him, yeah. knowing full well that they, they know that behavior. Um, and that's part of what we have to do in the training is, is, is allow our dogs an opportunity to learn what a point looks like, not just what they do themselves, but what another dog looks like on point, so that they recognise that visual stimulus or visual cue and come in and back. Because if they haven't seen it, they'll just blunder through and yeah. ruin the hunt effectively if they don't know what the other dog's doing. So part of the hunting dog's success is to recognise, hey, my mate's got one, I need to creep up behind him and help him out, back him. Brilliant. That is so interesting because, um, you, you know, when, the, when you're working with an, a, a pack of aggressive dogs where you've got a family of dogs living together and um they're aggressive then as they go out and i'm not talking about gun dogs i'm talking generally any breed um mm. the, you know the, the it's a real divide and conquer in yes it, rather than gun dogs and so they'll see that prey and one of them will go around the back of it and it's like when you're on a walk if you're walking you've got a couple of dogs coming towards you one of them will go around the back yeah. because that's the intrinsic behavior 
of a pack attack. Mm. And so it's yeah. really interesting when you think of, you know, a pack attack like that where the dogs will split and go behind rather yeah, than well, seen... a trained hunting dog who go in formation and go forward and stop and point. It's, it's, I mean, I know I've gone off topic, but for me, that's absolutely fascinating. Yeah, well, that, I mean, Amazing. bear in mind these bird dogs are, are conditioned from tiny and we run them generally into the wind. So they're looking to use their nose uh -huh. to get downwind of a bird. So, so basically, you know, it's stating the obvious, it's, it's the pause before the pants. The, yes. the point is the pause before the pants. So, you know, if, if your hunting dog, every time he kind of was running across the field, went, oh, there's a mouse there and just pounce, it's quite likely he would pounce and miss where the mouse is. So that pause is just that extra location. You'll see the dog come on point and then just use its nose to, to figure out through scent uh -huh. exactly to pinpoint where that, where that bird is or that prey is. And then subsequently when they're schooled, they, they pounce or they, they flush on command. So we yeah. tell them to get in and bang, in they go and produce the bird. And of course, they then have to sit and watch the bird away, which is tricky because that's counter, you know, it's, it's not yeah. what they would expect. They normally give chase or try and catch. So we have to make sure we school them not to do that, just to produce the bird and get it up in the air in the hope that there's some um, shooting to be had. That's brilliant. So how do you... Um... <clears throat> How how does does the work differ with the HPR to a setter or a pointer? How how is it slightly different, or is it pretty much the same? Uh, it, it's slightly different in 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 the breed lines themselves. You've got a slightly different dog, and within the pointers and setters, within the hunt point retrievers, again, that's one of the joys of the breed groups: pointers and setters and hunt point retrievers. Is, is although it's a breed group, you've got lots of different breed types yeah. within each group. So, you, you know, within the pointers and setters, you've got the, the red setters, the Gordon setters, the English setters, the pointers, people used to call them English pointers. pointers. You've got all these different breeds that all do the job very slightly different in the way they carry themselves, the height of their head, the speed they run at, the way they set. So my English setters, I have two English setters, they lie flat to the ground. The pointers stand in that big, high, traditional point-taking air from a long way in front. So... Um, that's that's the variation there but between the pointers and setters the most significant uh, difference is they don't in the uk at least mm -hmm. we don't ask our pointers and setters to retrieve no. hence the hunt point retriever is a different yeah. creature he has to have the hunting skills he has to have the pointing and the locating and holding skills but also then he has to be trained as a high quality retriever. You know, the dogs running in our open, in our championships, the Hunt Point Retrieve Championships, the, the top 10 dogs will be superb retrievers. I mean, first class retrievers that can be handled at, at great distances and pointed and, and directed just like a Labrador retriever, as well as all the other skills they have to master. So there's an awful lot to be, uh, to be done if you, if you want a, 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 a very tidy, smart Hunt Point Retriever. So what, I mean, I, I haven't seen you, I think I've seen you once since I moved to Scotland, which is over four years ago now, hard to believe, it's, <laughs> it's just zipped by. So what dogs have you got now, Howard? Because you, you mentioned, I didn't realise you had English pointers as well. So, Craigie, what, what have you got in your stable, so to speak? What so in the stable, in the kennel now, we have uh, two English setters, Sky and Flirty. Um, we have two... German short heads, two big uh, brown liver coloured German short heads, one called Enzo and a pal of mine that's called Heidi. I'm uh, helping uh, out a mate of mine with, with her. Um, we have one, two, three, four Springers, two Cockers, one Labrador, uh, gosh, what else? Oh, one Terrier. Um, he's not in the kennels, he lives indoors, much to my disgust. He's Lindsay's pride and joy uh, <laughs> over and above myself. <laughs> He takes precedence over everything. Um, uh, so those are the breed types. I don't think I've missed any out. Yeah. So spa uh, Springers, Cockers, German Shortheads. Oh, I've missed out the German Longheads. My, my goodness, how could I miss out the German Longheads? German Longheads. Um, uh, God, I think that's it. Oh, Labradors, yeah. So all those different breeds. Good grief. That's amazing. Mm, it's good fun. It's really good fun. I, 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 like I myself, mean... I, I just love... I just love everything about dogs, you know, whether they're, whether they're being schooled to be assistance dogs, 
drugs dogs are or in our case what we're involved in primarily in in uh, in game finding dogs are, i just can't get enough of it you know mm. In, you used to do a lot of work about this too, didn't you? Do you still do that or not so much now? No, that's kind of fallen apart a little. I say fallen apart. It's just the, the contact I had there. We, we At one time, we're taking three or four dogs a year from Battersea. I say taking, they would phone us and offer us dogs. Uh-huh. And to be fair, they they phone us every year and they ask us if there are certain dogs we can either take for them or find a home for them. So uh-huh. that's, why, that's why I've always affiliated myself to Battersea Dogs Home as a uh, as a charity because they if they have working dogs they'll look to find them working homes so for the guard breeds that as you probably know they put them into the police and the security f- uh, uh, industry um appropriate homes and with gun dogs if they find a gun dog they'll try and find it a gun dog home mm-hmm. that you know they're not anti um all of these things so that's why i've always admired battersea so much um and as a result of a demonstration we did at the new forest show battersea had a tent there and uh, they came to us and said, hey, you know, would you be interested in rehoming and well, reschooling a young dog we have? And he, he came to us. We had him. He was called Henry. He ended up staying with us. He was a collie cross English yeah. Springer Spaniel. I don't know whether you remember him. I, do, like, that, I can see him. He used to do What's the Time, Mr. Wolf, with you, didn't he? That's right. Yeah. He did all kinds of fun things. We, we learned a lot from Henry. Henry taught us an awful lot, particularly uh-huh. about collies, because that collie mind of his, he looked more like a collie than he did a spaniel. Um, although the spaniel in him just took the edge, the collie edge off him. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, um, and, and he then led us into, oh gosh, I don't know, we must have done about 12 dogs for Battersea Dogs Home, where we've had them in and reschooled them and then rehomed them. So, so yeah, a Battersea... Um, uh, again, it, it's it's been fascinating working with them. They were very kind to us. They took us up, let's see around the premises and find out a lot about what they did. Really interesting. Like anything, behind the scenes, there's an awful lot goes on that you don't get to see from, yeah. from first glances, so to speak. <clears throat> yeah, no, I, I remember him. I can remember seeing you do a display with them of what's the time with all. He used to sit on a chair, didn't he? We had, had Correct. He sit on the chair. Yeah. 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 yeah, he liked to sit up high and watch the world go by. Because he, you know, like so many dogs that come from true rescue backgrounds, they've had a pretty hard time. I said they've had a hard time. They're, they're not overconfident in and around humans. Humans have not always done them the best. Yeah. And so Henry, Henry used to worry about things. And um, he found that we, we discovered he, that he would put himself up on a chair and he just used to kind of fluff his chest out a little bit more once he got up on the chair. And you could see being higher, yeah, and, and in, his, in and in his chair, like we use place boards and targets nowadays, just makes them feel comfortable. So we used to take the chair every, everywhere we went with us, two demos, and, and in all our demos, he would just get up on the chair. So it was kind of fun, uh, uh, but it, it was done for a good reason. Henry, you know, uh, offered that behaviour, and, and we followed through because it clearly worked. Mm. No, that's great. And um, I mean, the other thing that you're really, really well known for is your shooting score. And yes. I can remember doing my safe shot with you yes. years and years and years ago. And that, that was really interesting because I don't, I don't shoot. Um, no. But it was great, used to, you know, coming down doing clays with you. And, and I, I used to shoot rifles, like three or threes and, you know, British Army rifles. I used to, I used to shoot years ago. Um, yeah. But so are you still doing a lot of shooting? Are you still doing a lot of... Um, yeah, well, I... Or when, I, when it was I, open? I, Sorry, Les, I'm talking over the top of you. I, I now do more because the dogs I hunt over, we shoot over. They're dogs that, you know, you, you're not driving birds towards waiting guns. Mm-hmm. The dogs are shot over. So I do, I'm shooting over dogs more than I ever did, which kind of combines my love for shooting and working gun dogs all at the same time. Hence another reason why the Spaniels and the hunt dog retrievers uh, I find so, so much fun. Um, uh, but nowadays, my son, Charlie, who's 27, God, gosh, really? you know, he's, he's, he's a grown man and, and he kind of runs the shooting school. So uh-huh. I used to do a lot of shooting lessons or give a lot of shooting lessons. Now, I only give shooting lessons to one client, one guy who won't mind me uh, using his name called Wilf, who insists that um, uh, he has me mainly to, to, to have a good old gossip and a catch up, really, two uh-huh. or three times a year. But I don't give shooting lessons anymore all of my time is consumed um more or less every day giving three or four dog lessons gun dog lessons per day 
Um, so um, that's what I do. But the shooting school kind of is run by Charlie, although it's just over the, you know, outside of, of us. Mm. <clears throat> and so can I ask you, because I haven't been grouse shooting. Um, yeah. I've, I've worked, you know, I've picked up partridge and, and um, pheasants. And now that I'm in Scotland, people are going, oh, you must go grouse shooting. But I mean, my knees couldn't take going through the heather. And, yeah. and all of that so how how does grouse shooting differ from you, you know the the traditional driven pheasant okay. shooting? it's a driven grouse shoot isn't it yeah well there's two versions of, of grouse you can have walked up which gonna is settle walked back and listen uh-huh. yeah so so walked up grouse shooting again is the, the most fun for me mm-hmm. um, uh, which is where we're using hunt point retrievers or yeah. pointers and setters to run the the moors um, and locate and find game and point and hold them uh, and flush them and then if we're lucky you know we can get up close enough to the grouse to get a shot and you know get to shoot one and retrieve it and take it home um, whereas uh, what grouse shooting is kind of famous for is is what's called driven grouse shooting and uh, that's kind of the mecca for a shooting uh, man or woman. Uh, Unfortunately, it's incredibly expensive to um, shoot grouse, which is what kind of tarnishes it, people's view of it, I'm afraid, you know, where they, where there's this, you know, anti-shooting lobby there. Mm -hmm. They kind of sometimes see it as something for, for rich, well-heeled people, which is true. You do have to need, have a lot of cash if you're going to go and shoot grouse. Um, driven grouse and so that's where guys uh, uh, teams of guns eight nine or ten guns uh, wait in butts that you'll see if you're lucky enough to go up on the grass moors you'll see these beautifully formed like round butts where they hide and then the birds are driven and, and uh, over the guns and it sounds you know uh, it, it's the the grouse uh, the flying grouse is is renowned for being one of the toughest shooting targets you will ever encounter yeah. um, in 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 shooting sports. So it's uh, it really is the mecca. But so two types walked up and driven. What we do lots of in in the season is walked up. We're very lucky to have opportunity to go up up north and do a lot of walked up, and that's considerably cheaper. I can tell you than um, the cost of of going driven grouse shooting. So they don't they don't have pegs as such how you do on on like a traditional driven pheasant shoot. There's no pegs that that all fix. You don't move around different pegs and different drives. Yeah, yeah, you do. But instead of a peg, you have a butt. This so it's slightly below ground, so uh-huh. that you're right down almost, not quite at, at eye level. So you're watching grass because grass fly very fly close. Like really, to the really. Yeah, they they hug the contours of the ground, which is what makes them so exciting. So they're not like a pheasant or a partridge that takes off and goes up excuse me, and stays up uh, for, for, for a while. Grouse just take off and then fly the ground in packs, big packs, anything from a single grouse to a pack of 30, 40, 50 might come through, um, depending on the moors you're on and, ha- and how densely stocked the moors. I say stocked, wrong word. They're not stocked, they're wild. You know, that's the yeah, wild ground, really yeah. exciting thing that they're all wild. So it's, it's such, a, such a privilege to be out, you know, with this moor. And the ecology and everything that goes on with the grouse moor itself is just the most fascinating place. I mean, you really should, there are some moors that aren't kind of knee deep in heather where, you, where it's relatively straightforward to walk on. And I would encourage anybody just to go and learn if you ever get an opportunity to go out with a grouse keeper uh, and learn about the ecology and all that goes on and all that goes in on it, it, with regards to keeping a moor is just the most fascinating um, subject, let alone studying the grass and how they behave. And, and uh, yeah, fascinating. There's so much that I don't know about it, but a um, little bit I do know is just wonderful. Because I find the whole keeping thing, I mean, we've got a mutual friend in Peter Stagg. And, yeah. um, you know, the, the amazing keeper who um, had the patience of the saint with me. I would be constantly you know, badgering them on the shooting, what's this and what's that, and what about this and what about yeah. and, um, and I find it really fascinating talking to him, just the whole cycle. I mean, he wrote a section in the Advanced Pet Gun Dog for me on the yeah. whole cycle of, you know, bringing in pulse, raising them. And, and I just find it really fascinating f- for me. And I know the people that I've trained who weren't necessarily in shooting to then when they start getting into it, it becomes very um, almost cliched, doesn't it? The whole circle of life, you know, we get really excited coming up to June, knowing the birds are coming in and 
Yeah. Route around in them all up and sending them back to the 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 game forms. It's just um the whole ecology behind it is amazing. And I mean I've seen you work your land as well, um, mm. where you've been putting down uh, cover, you know, game cover ready for when you've been preparing for your competitions. Yes. And yeah. I just find the whole thing fascinating. Yeah, it's such a you know the gamekeeper's role or, or 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 shooting. If you're interested in shooting, you know, there's so much to learn about. There's birds, there's livestock, there's wildlife, there's the countryside, there's the weather, there's the crops that are grown and are not grown, and the and and everything that it is just it's a massive subject. And as you correctly say, with somebody like Pete Stagg or Staggy, as he's known to us uh, down at um, uh, on the south coast there the knowledge of these people because they're so rounded you know they have to have a huge amount of knowledge it is fascinating and if you're lucky enough to stand with a keeper uh, either a grouse keeper or, or, or somebody who, who who works the pheasants and partridges down here their their knowledge of the countryside is just unbelievable it's it's amazing isn't it? and i mean because i teach um anatomy and physiology i teach comparative anatomy and physiology you know dogs and people and um and I've taught human anatomy for years. And I can remember standing one morning waiting, you, you know, to go off and start the drives of the day. And I wish I could remember his name and I can't. He's a really old guy, hopefully still around, really, really old guy, weathered guy. Um, yeah. Tan Tana, is it Tana you call them, where they start skinning the deer? And I yes. found this fascinating because there was a deer hanging and he was taking the skin off it and he was just... It was amazing because he was using, I'm going to describe it because this will be going out audio later, but he was using the knuckle of his index finger and he really? was literally just working mm. um, the skin, working the fascia to lift the skin off the deer. And mm. I could quite easily have went, okay, I'm not picking up today. I'm, I'm staying in here. Yeah, I'm going to stand and watch this guy. Yeah. It, was, it, was, it was so skilled and um, phenomenal to watch. And then I know you've, done it as well but when Pete started telling me about what they do as a keeper you think oh they're just looking after birds or they're just and there's always like oh they're just doing this or they're just a keeper and then we had a chat about um because the dog wasn't the food chain and having to um when you're doing the stalking to actually check all of the organs of the animals and make sure they're mm -hmm. healthy and and I said, like, oh my God, can I come and do this with you? <laughs> because I was so interested in the insides from an anatomy and, anatomy and physiology perspective. When I did yeah. a degree, I had to dissect a fetal pig. And did you? I did. I know, it was amazing. And I mean, it smelled. It was, you know, the formaldehyde smell was disgusting. But then in the thought of, to start off with, I had to pin it. And when that was done, as soon as we opened, it was like, I could... I was in my element. I thought yeah, I didn't know the diaphragm thing. looked like that. And oh my God, look! If you lift this out, you should have become a CSI. And... <laughs> you should have become a CSI. I know. <laughs> if I had my time again, I would love to have done. Um, yeah, anthropology. I would love to do. You know, like postmortems and anthropology. Yeah, what a fascinating subject. But you it's used to do that. Did you used to do that where you were? No, I've Into not that been involved with, with deer management and shooting, and subsequently the, what they call the growlicking and and the and the, and, the, and the you know dressing of a carcass. I've done it. I've been there, and I, I've been out, and uh, I've I've uh, had an opportunity to stalk both roe deer and red deer, um, which is fascinating and fantastic. But um, uh, the gun dog side of things just consumes me less. I just don't have enough time to do all these wonderful things, and uh, it's kind of maybe uh, as i get older i regret not focusing uh, sorry not having such a rounded view of life um but to, for me i'm just focused on on the the gun dog element of it and um it's all that really fascinates me at the moment uh, I, it's all i'm i just want to be the best and the best and the best that i can be at it and so all of my energy goes into that um uh, as much as there's a, a big wide world out there to look at isn't it but but then a lot of people would really um, be quite envious of that because you've got a passion and yeah. you've, you've got an all-consuming passion, which is awesome. I mean, it's, yes. it's awesome having that dedication and that passion to make you 
I have enough motivation and dedication mm. to get you up at silly o'clock and go to bed <laughs> really, really late and, <laughs> and just keep going day in, day out, you know, and um yeah. And and I don't know any I don't know any professional dog trainers who have not got knackered knees. And yes. so to to get, you, you know, I mean I know what it's like. I mean I was on stick for a long time as well with them and to have that dedication to keep going even though your knees I feel as if they're grunching and grinding and your body's yeah. giving up the will to function, but you're, the brain still wants to do it. Yes, it's it, I think you're quite right. It seems to be a dog trainer's um uh, illness um uh, it, it, i guess we do so much walking up down turning 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 and it yeah. just puts a lot of pressure on our, on 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 our little legs yeah <laughs> and, and when you go picking up as well it's like you know especially in the new forest where sometimes you're walking in knee high water and there's all the ruts and the divots and yeah it's yeah. tough going uh, walking the moors and the countryside it, it, uh, you know being part of uh, part of the shooting day is is being relatively fit of course it, it does require that you are yeah <clears throat> it is so what are your plans for the rest of the year once we we get i mean i presume you're just getting your dogs absolutely honed ready for coming out of lockdown yes yeah so um it's I've got, uh, what have I got? I've got those three Spaniels to compete with this year. I've got two very nice, very capable young HPRs, a, a, a German longhead called Troy and um, uh, a German shorthead called Enzo. Mm -hmm. And so um, getting those guys ready for October's shooting season and trialing. But in the meantime, if lockdown comes off quick enough, my two pointers and setters, uh, we'll be going up if we're lucky we'd have to be really lucky be, because um, uh, otherwise the trials will get cancelled we'll get out on the grouse in um, in August July August uh, to do the trialing with the setters so um, that's really the dogs that are on hold at the moment I think we'll be lucky if we do get out with them but I hope we will so yeah in, in, an, in, in a short answer we're, we're busy schooling our dogs developing our dogs it's it, it, it's um it's part of what we do as well as the work we do with other people here is develop our own dogs um ready for for trialing this year so this year really is about competing um i've been asked to run um to put on a working test which is the first one that the game fair has had a hunt point retrieve home international so england wow. scotland island wales it's huge it's going to be a massive thing for us with the hunt point retrievers it's the first time the Hunt Point Retrievers have been in the Home International Arena um, uh, on show. So we've got to put on a whole day's competition um, with teams from those from the Home International countries. So that's really exciting. And it's a bit that is the only thing that's, well, not the only thing, one of the things that the lockdown has really messed up because in theory, so the, the game fair itself has been put back to a date in September. Uh -huh. um, but we were really gearing up. We, we'd chosen the captains. We were, were about to do the selection for the England team, the Welsh team, the Irish team, the Scottish team had all been chosen. And so that's, that's kind of one of the highlights of my summer season um, that I'm still hoping will come off if, if we get out of lockdown quick enough and the game fair organisers can see a way through all this mess to put on a game fair. So it's the home international. So that'd be a, a, a feat of a, a lot of organisation requiring a lot of really good people to help me put that together. Some that's, that's again, part of this year's fun and games to look forward to. And you're perfect for doing that. I don't know how many people know, but you were part of the British team, weren't you? You went abroad with the British team. Yeah, yeah. I've been abroad uh, three times with the uh, British team, uh, the English team, to, um, uh, to Serbia and France. Twice to Serbia, once to France, um, which is just fantastic. Uh, the World Championships... Now, the Continental World Championships is, is something else. It's something you will never see done in the UK. Uh, on the scale, the number of people, the number of dogs, the quality of the dogs and the way they run them, which is slightly different to the way we run our dogs in the UK. Um, just a, a, an experience that's um, not to be missed if anybody ever gets an opportunity to do it. Do you think we'd ever do anything like that over here? Um, there was talk once it would be great to do the run the world championships but it's such a monumental um it's a huge uh, um 
competition. You know, there are 400 odd competitors. Uh, the amount of ground is the UK doesn't offer itself uh, to um, offering that amount of ground uh, that the, the Europeans have uh, for, for big running dogs. So it's unlikely to happen, I'm afraid. And, and also one or two other political uh, doggy political aspects that will probably stop the world championships coming to this country. But we have some great competitions, you know, with lots of home internationals and internationals that are mainly held at the game fair. So we get to see dogs from abroad running. But if you want to see uh, hunt point retrievers and setters running big, fast, powerful animals, um, going to the world championships or going out on the continent is the place to see them really open up and run big, 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 fast running dogs. We, we just can't comprehend it. I mean, I, I find it because I, I mean, I'm so used to working with British, British gun dogs and they've got their own niche compared with the HPRs. Mm. Uh, you know, they've all got their own little job to do. They, you know, they're flushing or they're retrieving or they're setting. Yeah. Or, and you just don't, you can't comprehend the range. I know um, Hannah Spearman, who runs Vigla, she went out with the uh, Vigla team hung, to Hungary and yeah. she came back and described these vast distances that they were working the dogs. You just mm. can't get your head around it, you know, you can't, unless you've seen it, you can't. You yeah, can't yeah, it. it's, it's, and, and they, they, you know, they put on a lot of pomp and ceremony. They have massive opening ceremonies, you know, yeah. it's really like a mini Olympics that you go on as part of the England team and they play the national anthem. There's a big stage and, and, and you know, this is a whole two weeks of this competition. We're all based out there Correct. and there's lots of driving to and from uh, trialing grounds. It, it's, it's just, uh, it's just something else. It really is. It's, it's fascinating to go and do it. And, and each different country, the host countries, because they choose a host country each year, hosts it slightly different along with the, you know, the culture that that country brings. So Serbia uh, was right on. The, we, we went over there and it was touch and go as to whether we could or couldn't go. It was called off and then back on um, the World Championships in Serbia in 20, gosh, I can't remember when it was, 20 something, 14, 15. Mm -hmm. um, uh, 15 it would have been, um, you know, uh, down in, in the the very rural areas of Serbia was just a, a, another an, an, another world. It's a world apart from the, the modern society we live in. Mm. But it just, what an experience, Howard. You mm. know, it's, it's, Wonderful. What, it's, it's, such, it's been such a journey for you, you know, and we started off talking about the Kuni Kuni Pig and now we're talking about representing England at the... Yeah at the championships you know in Serbia like what a journey it's yeah amazing. dogs and dogs not just gun dogs dogs have allowed me an an awful lot of fascinating an opportunity to see and do an awful lot of fascinating things yeah and that that comes from the passion and the dedication to do it yes yeah you do need to be pretty but I was interesting you were talking about it earlier and you were talking about the dedication and the hard work and and that's when well, you noted it is it's how lucky someone is when you're doing something that you enjoy so much because it's not hard work. You, you, you know, you're just having a bloody good time. Um, <laughs> you know, I, if you had asked me at 60, if you had told me at 16 that I'd be earning a living from training and hunting dogs and running a shooting school, it's like, that's a, you know, that's a Hollywood job for me. And here we are, I'm fortunate enough to be in that position. And so uh, life is not hard for me. And, um, Getting up in the morning definitely isn't. It's um, as you say. It's uh, I'm very lucky to be in, in a position that suits me. Wouldn't suit everybody, but it just happens to to fit my boat, so to speak. That's awesome. Absolutely brilliant. Howard, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you as always. And um, great to catch up with you too. We miss you being up there in Scotland. I mean, we used to meet up in Marlborough once a month, if not less. Um, uh, uh, more, sorry, uh, for a gossip and a catch up and, and, and discussing the bit business we were both were running at the same time. So I miss that, Les. It was, uh, it's nice to catch up with you too. It is. No, I do miss that you used to go, go and put the world to rights in the pub in Marlborough and <laughs> have something to eat <laughs> and plan, plan the next thing. Oh, how are we going to run these tests? We're going to work in gun dog certificate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've we've concocted a lot of courses and stuff in a on the back of a fag packet. Well, that was for me. I do not like smoke on on the back of an A4, whereas you'd always have a neat file and do it all very nicely. <laughs> I'd kind of go, yeah, I think I'll remember that and have to rely on you to get it right. Yeah, we've certainly had some good times together, Les. So um, 
thank you very much for, for asking me to uh, come on your podcast. Oh, I'm really glad you did. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so I shall talk to you again soon. And, you know, once we get the other end of the season, it'd be really cool to have you come back and tell us all about it and see how you got on. I'm delighted to. Absolutely delighted. That's great. Thank you. Well, take care of yourself and have a good evening. And I'll catch up with you again soon. You too, Des. Thank you again for asking me to be on. You're welcome. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.